So it's not a lecture, indeed, what I want to do. So in 2012 and 2019, no, sorry, in 2016 and 2019, the American uh, Statistical Association made two official statements regarding p-values and statistical significance, which I suppose uh, many of you use. So they are quite strong uh, statements and they are leading to major changes in uh, publication, in research and also in teaching. So some of you may not be aware of this and uh, maybe some of you have heard about this but didn't have the time yet to go through these statements. So what I wanted to do is give you a summary of them and what they imply, especially for MMIV. It's, it's, it's important to be aware of them. So I will really just go through these two papers and quote uh, verbatim from them. And um, let me start from the one from 2016. And they give a summary in six major points. So I will just quote the points. I've reordered them uh, from the least surprising to the most surprising. Indeed, uh, for some of you, what we are going to see can be shocking. So brace yourself. Uh, let's go to the least controversial statement. They say proper inference requires full reporting and transparency. I think we are all very well aware of that. And that's no surprise here. Let's go to another statement. They say p-values can indicate how incompatible the data are with a specified statistical model. Notice that the stress on can indicate. They don't say they do indicate. But I think most of you also are aware of the fact that p-values need some interpretation. So not quite a surprise here. Let's get to the second statement. P-values do not measure the probability that the studied hypothesis is true or the probability that the data were produced by random chance alone. And again, I think, I, I suppose that you know that uh, a p-value is not really a probability of a hypothesis. So again, not much of a surprise here. Let's go to the sixth statement. They say, by itself, a p-value does not provide a good measure of evidence regarding a model or hypothesis. And this is quite a strong statement. It means uh, if you are publishing some research result, according to the American Statistical Association, we can't just base our conclusion on p-values. We need something more. You say this by itself. Let's, let's go forward. And the statement is a p-value or statistical significance does not measure the size of an effect or the importance of a result. And uh, this is a quite a strong, uh, a strong uh, statement. So we can't refer to p-values or sig statistical significant, interpret them as the size or effect of the importance of the results we obtain. And then we come to the last statement, which is very strong. So scientific conclusions and business or policy decisions should not be based only on whether a p-value passes a specific threshold. So this is a strong statement. It means uh, if we have a conclusion, if we want to make a, need to make a decision, choose a method or any kind of result we have, we cannot propose it just based on result uh, um, determined by p-values. We need to give some more uh, argument. Right, OK, size effect matter. But there's more to that. There is more to that. It's not just the size effect. That's the, the critical part of it. So you see, there are strong statements. There are two things to this. Uh, first of all, they are not saying, uh, uh, so speaking with past colleagues, sometimes they, uh, they thought that this was a statement recommending be careful when you use. So it was a statement against the mis misuse of p-value. So if you misuse the p-value, then you can get uh, uh, wrong conclusions. This is more than that. This is saying that even if you use the p-value correctly, you still can get the wrong conclusions which is quite a stronger statement. That's why they say you can only base your conclusions on p-values and statistical significance. This was the first statement, 2016. And uh, two years ago, in 2019, they made this statement even stronger and they added something more. So they first give a summary. They say no p-value can reveal the possibility, presence, truth, or importance of an association or effect. Therefore, a label of statistical significance does not mean or imply that an association or effect is highly probable, real, true, or important. Nor does a label of statistical non-significance 
lead to association of an effect being improbable, absent, false, or unimportant. So this undermines completely any kind of results based on p-values. And uh, this is a very strong statement. And uh, they also give a summary of the previous paper. Notice here, for example, don't base your conclusion solely on whether an association effect was found to be statistical significant, statistically significant. Notice that this is included uh, even if you consider uh, eff effect size and so on. And the, uh, the last one, don't conclude anything about scientific or practical importance based on statistical significance or lack thereof. Quite, uh, quite a strong statement. And to this, in, uh, in 2019, they add this. Don't say statistical significance, statistically significant. They say it is time to stop using the term statistically significant, uh, statistically significant entirely. Nor should variance such as significantly different or p less than 0 0.05 and non significant survive, whether expressed in words, by asterisks in a table, or in some other way. This it comes very close to a ban against uh, using. Uh, statistical significance. And again, it's not a matter, they're not saying uh, be careful how you use them. It's, it's more subtle than that. So some of you may be shocked about this. Uh, some of you knew already about this. First of all, let me give some context uh, for this. It's not that one day the American Statistical Association woke up and said, ah, I don't want to use this anymore. There is a long history or maybe let me skip this for the moment. So there is a long history starting already from 1948 of criticism against the use of statistical significance to the use of p-values. Uh, methodological criticism. So the very foundation of the method was, was uh, seen to be to have fallacies, even when used correctly. In the past 75 years, there's been countless papers, also by famous statisticians, criticizing this method and its use. So this I show here just a, a, a handful of them. And you see also very famous name, right? Like, like Cox or Cadence or somewhere is here. It's... So there has been a criticism against the very method of based on uh, p-values and statistical significance in the past 75 years. But still uh, the method has, has been used all the time. So that's why suddenly the Statistical Association made a, took a stance against this method. And uh, so this statement, and again, it's not me saying this, by the way, so I'm just, uh, I'm just reporting what this, the, the American Statistical Association said, is leading to several changes. So, and these are what they are important for us. So first, research and publishing, teaching, and I think there are also ethical implications here. So first of all, uh, some journals already banned the use of p-values. For example, this journal, Basic and Applied Social Psychology, already in 2015, they said that the null hypothesis significance tensis procedure is invalid. And from now on, this journal is banning this procedure. So if you want to, pro to publish your results in this journal, you cannot base your results on null hypothesis significance tensis testing. This is a most extreme case, but you will notice that uh, as, as time passes, you will, for example, meet more reviewers that ask you to base your conclusion not just on null hypothesis testing and p-values. They will ask you to provide alternative methods, or maybe the editors will ask you for that. So the editorial policies of uh, journals are changing. You may not see the change now, maybe in your field, but it's really propagating across all fields. This is another example from Frontiers in Human Neuroscience. Here we have a review saying that uh, null hypothesis statistical significance should no longer be the default to mean a statistical practice of our biomedical and psychological research. And also the educational approach for students um, that has sustained the widespread spurious use of null hypothesis statistical significance testing should be phased out. So the first warning is that if you don't see it now, you will see in some years, you will meet reviewers that don't accept your methodology if you are using p-values and null hypothesis testing. They will ask you for something more. Or even editors that say, no, you must change your, uh, your, um, your methods. 
uh, you will see this propagated to more and more journals. Uh, by the way, say in some fields like astrophysics, nobody uses p-values and null significance uh, uh, null hypothesis testing anymore. If you check the papers, for example, you remember when they, for the first time, they saw uh, a black hole and they had to, to check if what they saw was really a black hole. So all the tests are based on methods that are different from p-values. So physics, astrophysics is one of those fields that has abandoned p-values many years ago because they were already aware of their flaws and they were especially relevant flaws in this field. But this is just an example. So the, the other point is teaching. So this thing, this, this, as years goes by, it's possible that if not ourselves, but the young students now will be requested to, to base their results on different methods than just p-values or null hypothesis testing. So I think it's important that we make sure that our students also learn alternative methods so that, they did not, that their career does not suffer later on. If it happens that these p-values are completely outlawed or they receive an even stronger criticism. So we must think about that. And uh, so I think it's also an ethical matter here. So we must consider this. We have this method. We may base our uh, results or uh, some decision that we must take on this method. This method has been criticized for 75 years. And now it's also been officially criticized by a national statistical association. So are we comfortable using this method? or maybe we are comfortable. Something that I would like to stress, and that's my first message. So let me say this, first of all, uh, by doing this informative uh, talk, I don't want to push you to accept what the statistical, American Statistical Association is doing. I think our first step is to, as scientists, is to go and read this statement. It's, it's an important statement, strong statement made the, that comes from an important source. So I think the first thing we must do is go as scientists, read the statement and assess it by ourselves. It's possible that some of you can find fallacies in what the American Statistical Association is saying. They say, no, you're too extreme. I don't agree with you because of this or this reason. And that's, uh, that's how science proceeds. So that's perfectly fine. I think the most important step is that we go and really read these statements and become more aware of that and their implications. And uh, so let me add something about this. For those of you who are maybe want to follow what the statistical, American Statistical Association is saying, and they say, don't do, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. What should I do then? There are resources for this. If you read the second paper by the American Statistical Association, they discuss several approaches. And also there is a, a, the full um, issue of the journal, and it's all open access as a series of articles presenting alternative approaches. So that's where you, what you can refer to. Another paper that I would like to suggest is this paper by, I think Noeska can help me here pronounce this uh, surname. It's uh, this Dutch statistician. It's a really nice paper from 2007. He explains with concrete examples, what are the problems with p-values, even when they are correctly used, and they, he proposes some practical solutions. What I find interesting in this paper, it also gives the possibility for people who, are, uh, who have already invested in, say, software that is based on p-values to use the same software uh, with different methods. So that these kind of resources that we, we bought are not just wasted. So I think this is a nice resource to read. So I want to, to finish here. My main points are, again, I'm not trying to force, I don't want to force on you what the American Statistical Association is saying. I just want to make you aware of that. I think a very important thing is that we read the statement and we draw our own individual conclusions. Even if you don't agree, that's fine. But what's important is this, this statement, this official statement will have consequences. So it's not something that we can uh, just wait and see what happened. Whether you agree with the statement, and so you want to follow it, or whether you disagree, you will have to do something. If you disagree, you will find, you will arrive at some point in which you must argue for the method you are using with reviewers. 
if you agree with the statement, you will have to change your, the methods you are using if you're, you are only using p-values for the moment. So it's better to be informed about this, as they say in English, for one is for armed. So we know what's happening, and no matter what your stance is, you are prepared, and you know that, that change is coming, and you know how to face it. So that's the main message uh, of this uh, sort of inf information uh, talk. I think, uh, did I manage to stay on time, uh, Marek? That's the end of it. Yes, okay, great. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Luca. For if you have any questions, I don't know if uh, uh, how yes. much did I take. It is uh, time for a question. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand or ask directly, or you can type in in the chat. So we have a question from Laura. Laura, please. Oh, it was just clapping. Sorry, I might have hit the wrong button. <laughs> okay. Oh, by the way, yes. Uh, um, maybe I can do that later, but I will actually let me share these two papers. They are very short papers, actually, these two statements. So if you find some times, just go and, uh, and read them. And uh, let me share the two statements with you. So let's stop sharing, first of all. I can restart the video. And I see also there is someone else that says, Chetil says, uh, oh, it's, it's giving some, uh, oh, that's great, Chetil. Yeah, maybe you can explain what, uh, the link that you um, that you shared. Uh, yes, in uh, very simple terms, it's uh, just a statistical software. Uh, it's free of use and it's developed uh, in Amsterdam, and it includes uh, Bayesian uh, statistics. And it's uh, really fast, so you will get uh, the results instantly. Or, uh, in my experience, it's much easier to use, at least on simple tables, than SPSS, for instance. Great. So, just uh, an alternative to SPSS. Yeah, we need these kind of alternatives. Yeah. Okay, please. Uh, okay, yes, there's a question. Uh, no, I, I, the, it's a very basic question. I think it's great to, uh, to talk about this, but I think the format is too limiting. I, you know, th this it sounds like a week long discussion we could have on this topic. <laughs> and I'm just wondering if you have a suggestion on how we can make that happen in the context of MMIV. Uh, if you're asking me, so I think first of all, it's just reading the papers. That's a starting point also because we are more informed. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I don't know, maybe each, each team in MMIV can have a, a discussion within the team, what does implies for them, if they agree, they disagree, and then have a sort of a discussion at MMIV level. I think like a most club, of you, or... sorry? Is this a journal club idea or how do you? I, to be honest, I don't know how we want to organize this. Okay. And also it depends on uh, how important it. it is for you. Yep. But I think it's a first step. My, what I thought it was important is make people very informed about this. Mm -hmm before it's too late. I would like to share the files, but I, to be honest, I don't know how to do this. Can I just drop them in the chat? Yeah. We have a question of, of, from Leif. Could you post the references or share the presentation? Yes, absolutely. Actually, you have the references that I use are given in these the statements in themselves. So if you read the statement, then you have all the full set of references that explain, and, especially they motivate why they have to make this, uh, this statement. That's important. And our seminar is recorded, so it will be available uh, later on the YouTube on our channel. So you can you can watch it again. And Perfect. Okay. Uh, this is a very interesting topic, but if there is no further question, let's proceed to the next speaker. Yes, Kari. So uh, the next speaker is uh, Frank uh, Riemer. And as most of you know, Frank is a MR physicist uh, working in the Advanced Neuroimaging Project here at MMIV. Something you probably don't know about Frank, though, is that he loves multe, which is a Norwegian delicacy, a wild berry, very hard to come by, growing mainly in the mountains in Norway. But uh, Frank, he thinks Norwegian chocolate, melkechokolade, is a crime. Today, Frank will give us a talk about dynamic switching between mode networks, 
uh, across alternating periods of rest and active task processing. So please, Frank, the Zoom is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, I hope you can all see my presentation now. Is that visible? We can see it. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, uh, my talk is, uh, it's, it's a very long title and it's a bit of a um, confusing title. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail into it. I've just uh, taken the title from the, uh, the publication that this is based on which um, we had uh, accepted at the end of last year. And I would just like to tell you a bit more about this research. So um, just a little bit of general background about uh, fMRI. So this is an fMRI study. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with fMRI, uh, fMRI is a technique to highlight uh, regions of very subtle blood flow uh, changes in the brain. And these are associated with uh, a brain region uh, doing something that is uh, related to uh, either a task or sometimes also resting state uh, networks. And um, yeah, basically these are these two main techniques uh, that we use for resting uh, for functional MRI. And the idea is that, um, for example, here you see on this uh, image, you see this uh, red and yellow blob, that this is actually something that corresponds to your motor function of uh, using your hand. And yeah, the idea is that if you can map these things, you can look at also uh, changes in health and disease. Um, so uh, as you saw on the title, uh, it was talking about the DMN. Um, so what is the DMN? Um, so the DMN stands for the default mode network, uh, which is commonly studied using resting state fMRI. Um, in very, very simplistic, uh, uh, simplified terms, you could think of it being the autopilot or the subconsciousness of your brain. It's something that seems to be, uh, there seem to be regions in the brain that fluctuate in activity uh, when we're doing nothing or when we're trying to do nothing. So this is basically done by someone lying in a scanner and they have uh, their focus on just um, having their eyes open and looking at a black screen or like a little uh, crosshair to uh, just be focused on one thing and not doing anything else. Uh, this has been ex studied extensively in health and disease. The idea is that if you have uh, a disease that these uh, networks, these sort of uh, time correlated uh, changes in the blood flow are related to those. Um, so the EMN, so the EMN stands for the extrinsic mode network. Um, there have been a few studies before, uh, such as by Federenko et al, um, who've identified this region in the frontal cortex of the brain, which you can see here on the left, uh, under on and off. Um, but it was sort of um, Huckdahl and Reichle and the group here in Bergen actually, who coined this term extrinsic mode network as sort of uh, an opposite to the default mode network. So while the default mode network is often referred to as an extrin intrinsic mode network, uh, the extrinsic mode network, so E and I, <laughs> sorry, it's a bit confusing, um, is a kind of the opposite. So this is something that is a network in the brain that is upregulated or has increased blood flow uh, when we're doing something or when we're about to change from not doing something to doing something. And how they... Um, discovered this or how they tried to go about uh, identifying this region was they used just uh, nine different fMRI studies that were done here in Bergen. And there were really um, lots of different studies. They, they have not a lot in common. There are different uh, paradigms. They're looking at uh, audio, visual, uh, motor function. And they did a conjunction analysis. And a conjunction analysis just basically means we look at uh, overlapping um, commonalities of uh, these activations. And they found uh, that there is this uh, area in the frontal cortex that is uh, uh, upregulated when we go from doing nothing to doing something. And there was also a follow-up study which looked at uh, retrospective analysis of a uh, um, listening paradigm. And at the figures at the bottom, you just see these two networks on the right, the, um, uh, off to on, 
that's the default mode network. Uh, so you have these distinct uh, regions uh, in, the, in the back of the brain, the precuneus, um, but also um, some of the areas in the front. And uh, this, this graphic is not uh, done from resting state data. So this was done with task-based data. Um, so we uh, followed on this study, um, the, the data was already acquired a few years ago, and this was done um, using uh, uh, a study that was designed to uh, investigate this uh, effect, and uh, it was done with just three visual tasks. Uh, it's a basic, um, I would say, old school uh, fMRI block design, where you have uh, blocks of activity or um, a task interspersed with uh, blocks of rest where uh, the participant is just uh, presented with a blank screen. And um, yeah, and uh, for these, we had three different tasks. So one is a ar ar arithmetic task where you have to um, uh, add two numbers and then um, use a little clicker in your hand to say whether this corresponds to a certain number. And the other one is a, a Stroop uh, type NBAC task, uh, here seen in C, which is um, you see a word that uh, of a color that doesn't correspond to the color that that word is uh, printed in. It's uh, quite often used in uh, uh, neuroscience. Um, it's a, a good test that is uh, also quite tasking. Uh, in addition, we did a mental rotation task, which you see here at the bottom in B which is you see um, two shapes and you have to say whether uh, one is a rotation of another or if these are two different shapes that you're observing. Um, so in terms of the technical details, the, we did very uh, standard uh, pre-processing. So this was all done in SPM. Uh, it's just basically a realignment to take care of uh, movement. Uh, MNI space normalization, this uh, to uh, registers all the data to a template. So this makes it uh, possible to do a group analysis uh, of all the subjects and then uh, smoothing the data. Uh, four subjects were excluded due to artifacts or incomplete imaging. And um, we also uh, did this uh, graphic here on the right, which is just a representation of the movements of subjects which is great to see if there are any um, correlations between movements, which could lead to um, correlations in the signal changes as well. And it's a great metric just to uh, exclude uh, subjects that may have uh, moved too much. In terms of the uh, statistical processing, this was done using a uh, standard uh, GLM, uh, general linear model analysis on the first level. So that's the intersubject, uh, intrasubject uh, level uh, within the subject, sorry. And uh, second level group analysis uh, for all the subjects and all the individual tasks. And then as in the publications before, we did a conjunction analysis, which was done using a one-way ANOVA random effects model. Uh, in addition, we highlighted some uh, regions based on the uh, statistical analysis that we used for an RRI time course analysis. Now, moving on to the results. Uh, first of all, the behavioral data. This is just data that is recorded um, uh, from the, uh, the trigger mechanisms that the uh, subjects have in the scanner to um, confirm their choices about the tasks and what they think is the right and wrong um, answer. Um, basically, what we measure here is the, the time, the response time. And from that, you can uh, say whether there are any outliers uh, in terms of how long someone took to take, do the task, which then in turn could mean they didn't understand the task. But that was all as expected. Uh, it was uh, fairly, uh, the average was uh, fairly close together, uh, which confirms that all the subjects understood the tasks and were following the tasks uh, correctly to their abilities. In terms of uh, covariates for um, a statistical analysis, we looked at uh, regressors for motion, also the subject's age uh, and gender, and those did not affect the results. Uh, based on the uh, graphic that I showed earlier, we excluded um, uh, some mild motion subjects. Uh, that was really, really mild uh, motion, which would not normally reject it in um, any other neuroscience circumstance. So um, 
we just wanted to do this as a, as a further uh, a further step of verif verification as uh, so we did that that did not change the results and um, yeah moving on graphically to the results so here we see the analysis of the group analysis uh, the results of the group analysis so what we have here basically we see um, a brain uh, we have left in in a is uh, the movement from the uh, uh, on to off blocks uh, and in uh, and B, the right, we have the movement from the off to on block. So the default mode network on the right and the extrinsic mode network on the left. So um, uh, basically what these colors mean, we have the, the main colors, uh, red, blue, and green, which correspond to the working memory, the mental rotation, and the mental arithmetic task. And then we have these, uh, in addition, these colors, uh, violet, cyan, yellow and white, which uh, is uh, highlight uh, joint activation of combinations of uh, the different tasks. Um, basically what this figure tells you is that uh, there is a great overlap in uh, all the tasks uh, as expected because they're all uh, using um, a visual paradigm. So um, all the tasks are presented with little uh, screens and goggles. So you're using your eyes and your uh, visual cortex to process these. Um, so there is a good overlap and uh, they clearly highlight um, the regions that we're expected to see. Um, we then um, perform the uh, conjunction analysis where we just basically look at uh, the, the commonalities uh, of these different tasks. We see again um, on, the, on the left uh, going from uh, on to off, we see the, uh, what we call the extrinsic mode network. And when going from off to on, we see the uh, default mode network uh, or parts of it. Um, and uh, this was really nice because this looked very, very similar to the previous two publications that we presented and also similar to the work by um, other uh, uh, people who have published on this. Um, just as a further thing in terms of trying to gauge out uh, how these two networks are related in time. We did a, a time course analysis just to highlight how these um, two regions basically um, start being upregulated and downregulated, um, connected. Uh, so one goes up and the other one goes down, and then the other one goes up and the other one will go down. And this is basically done here uh, for this region of interest uh, analysis, which basically um, used in all the subjects, these red and blue areas. In blue is the default mode network, in red is the extrinsic mode network. And for all subjects, we average the time course of the bold pattern in these regions. And you can see that uh, the two signals are clearly anti-correlated, um, despite the fact that what you see in this time course are the different tasks. So. Um, as the beginning um, of the uh, of the chart at the bottom shows, uh, I think it was the, the mental arithmetic um, paradigm. It would then go into a different paradigm, but this doesn't matter because these uh, two regions are going uh, in and out of um, uh, uh, correlation or in and out of um, activation linked to each other, as we had uh, hoped to see. And just to wrap this up uh, in terms of the discussion, um, what we see, so the SMA, which is the supplementary motor area, um, which we use as a, a proxy for the extrinsic mode network uh, was activated uh, just as seen as in previous studies. And the precuneous region, which we use for the default mode network uh, was uh, down -re regulated in response, uh, just as we uh, would have expected. Um, this confirms that these networks are not dependent on the sensory modality. So it didn't matter whether we used the, the listening tasks in the previous studies, the mixture of tasks, or now using the visual tasks. Uh, there are some minor differences uh, due to change of modality. And um, also in the time course, there were some areas where there was uh, a positive and negative correlation. So the, um, as it, it looks like they're really out of sync to each other, but uh, when you do the stats using a uh, moving uh, window analysis, you can see that there are also some um, positive uh, 
correlations. Uh, and this needs uh, further investigation. It could just mean that this is a little bit more difficult. Um, the combination of tasks, as you saw in the multicolored figure, um, shows uh, different extents of indicated areas, uh, even though they're quite uh, similar, uh, which could mean there may be a modulation of uh, networks. And um, the arithmet mental arithmetic task uh, showed no clear pattern that was different from the other two tasks. This could be because um, this also had a memory component uh, associated to it. And I know we're a little bit uh, running short on time, so I'll just leave it at that and we can go into questions. And I just want to thank uh, all the uh, collaborators in the study and also the uh, funders. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for an interesting talk, uh, Frank. So if you have any questions to Frank, please uh, ask them directly or post them on the chat. I have a quick question. Um, maybe I just didn't get it, but uh, the, the, how did you calculate, you, you're saying you, you went from on to off and from off to on. So did you subtract the two blocks or was this a measure in between the two blocks? I, I didn't get how you calculated the Okay, so it's basically um, the the uh, statistical assumption that you put into the model. If you if you asking um, whether you see um, uh, whether you go from uh, something that is uh, zero to something that is uh, different to zero, or whether you're going from something that's different to zero to zero so you basically you're just looking at the same thing in uh, two different ways uh, so, okay, so so it's the normal you, you just subtract the blocks from each other is that it's a difference between the two um yes more no? or less in, in a simplified way so it's, it's basically just the initial assumption whether you assume your um your uh your uh, null hypothesis basically is uh, that you've been um active or whether it is you've been resting yeah mm -hmm. okay thanks so we also have a question from Hauke uh, what are uh, the next steps uh, yeah a very good question so um, as part of this data set we also um, acquired uh, resting state data so um, the next step is to to look at this resting state data um, for the exactly same subjects recorded in the same sessions and see um, how those uh, line up and if um, the proxy we've been using here is, uh, is uh, really uh, relevant and does tell us a little bit more about the resting state fMRI. So I don't think this is like a replacement for resting state fMRI, but it helps us understand the technique a little bit more and investigate this more. And this is actually now being pursued by uh, Justina. So I'm um, uh, just seeing there's another question by Hauke, which I'll just read out. It's, uh, can the region analysis be extended to a whole brain analysis? Uh, yes, it, it can be. So um, what uh, one could do, so if you uh, would just um, now throw it together, doing the same region as a whole brain analysis, obviously would just get uh, lots of noise because everything averages out. But um, what actually Justina is working on, she's using um, independent component analysis. So um, we're looking at the whole brain changes with an independent uh, component analysis to see if we can then um, split this into uh, networks that correspond in, in time to each other. I have one quick question. I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah. So you've shown us this visualization in the brain where you color regions for different tasks and you had like, I don't know, six colors and then you had the color white. And you said the white is when like all tasks are on top of each other. But how do you go about when there are only like maybe two tasks using the same regions or three or whatever this I couldn't see in, in okay. the visualization. Yeah, um, there were also, um, uh, th there were different colors. So um, so white was for all three tasks. And then we had uh, yellow, which was for a combination of two tasks, the working memory mm -hmm. and mental arithmetic task. And then we had violet for 
another two. So there are um, different colors, but um, yeah, I think this could be improved in terms of visualization. I think definitely, because I'm actually, um, I have problems with colors and I actually had to go with the, um, I had to do this with a, with a um, pipette tool um, so that the computer can tell me which color is which. So um, I think, yeah, we can have a chat offline maybe and uh, think about how this could be improved. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Ute, and thank you very much to all the other speakers. Um, that's been a great seminar. I'll just wrap this up here. We'll have uh, the next seminar in one month's time. And let's hope for some um, good news from Ben Hoyer, and maybe we can even have it uh, in person in the lecture theater again. So yeah, thank you all very much and have a good rest of the day.